In all the earth, there are no older rocks than these, slumbering under quilts of cloud. Legend has it that somewhere in this wilderness near the sky is the cave where Arthur sleeps, the hero king and his men awaiting the call to arms in Snowdonia. If Wales has need of them, they will awake with a day. These are the stumps of great volcanoes that were active when the world was young. Ground down by the elements, Snowdonia is nonetheless the highest land in Wales and England. Fourteen peaks, including Snowdon itself, rise above 3,000 feet. This is Erari, the land of eagles. Her northwestern approaches are precious to Wales. Through the centuries, these heights have daunted invaders, Romans, Vikings, Normans, English, making penetration hard, subjugation impossible. Here, traditions have been upheld, identity guarded. Snowdonia has taken the strain. Today's pressures are more subtle, stemming not from swords and spears, but from civilization. The new mobility encourages pleasure seekers towards the great outdoors. Any means of getting there will do. Now, the mountains are a resource for farming, for quarrying slate, for generating power. Above all, for recreation. How to reconcile such uses with preserving Snowdonia's essence is the modern problem. If too many people come to the place to admire its beauty, to study the area, then simply by sheer numbers they will destroy the very beauty that they have come to see. Howell Roberts is a warden of the Nature Conservancy Council. The council was set up in 1949 to safeguard Britain's remote haunts of wildlife. It's the warden's job to move around Snowdonia's high ground, observing, monitoring, recording, sometimes experimenting. He loves this landscape, especially the Comidwell Reserve above the Nant Francon Pass. I feel that it is my responsibility, my nature reserve. Because it is my responsibility, I become attached to the place. It grows on me. The lake and the shrapneled cliffs above it testify to the deep ice which crusted the terrain 10,000 years ago. As the world grew warmer, the glacier carved its way towards the sea. leaving a trail of boulders. Gouging and scoring what lay in its path. Since those traumas, the Earth's face has mellowed to a mature beauty, recognized with Snowdonia's designation as a national park. Its character is to be protected, but there shall be access to it and folk shall earn a living in it. Once the sheep move up to high pastures, escorting dogs and men will leave them to graze endlessly. Just as the flock's welfare is a constant preoccupation here, so a way of life is zealously nurtured in Snowdonia. There is commitment to a farm, to a family, to an ancient language, the mother tongue of Pierce Williams. <laughs> He almost blends into the mountain, a uh, very hard character, used to the 
harsh elements and the hard weather that we have in Snowdonia. Once you get to know him, he's quite friendly and nowhere near as harsh as first appearances appear. He is very conscious of his heritage, very conscious of what the place means to him and he hopes that his children will have the same feeling for the place. Between the mountains are squeezed Snowdonia's tiny towns and villages. Even on streets and pavements, these wiry, nimble folk are hill people. Elsewhere in Snowdonia, there is space for surprises, as where the mountains slope to the Mediterranean caricature by Clough William Zellis, Port Meirion. before Port Marion, Stone Age man used the igneous rock here to make tools and weapons for export to Britannica's warlike tribes. The circular dwelling places with stout walls were built by Celts. From these hilltop forts, they could observe the approach of strangers. At Segontium, the Roman Empire reached its westernmost limits. Several hundred soldiers were garrisoned at this strong point above Carnarvon. They guarded prospectors seeking mineral wealth. Snowdonia's rocks yielded lead and copper, but even the Romans couldn't find gold this far north in Wales. But since the Romans' day, others have found gold, either by mining or, like Jack Whittaker, by panning patiently beside the upcountry streams. They seek, they sift, they buy their time. And sometimes they find. Snowdonia gives up gold grudgingly, but from some of its nuggets, wedding rings have been fashioned for kings and queens. The first English monarchs to establish a presence here were the Plantagenets. Containment of the Welsh was their aim within a string of granite-hard castles, Harlech, Carnarvon, Bomaris and Conwy have dominated Snowdonia's periphery for 700 years. Howell Roberts is more at home elsewhere. The Welsh also built castles. Here at Dolbadden, we have a rather modest castle. This castle was a home for a family, not a garrison. Here, the prince would entertain those people that came to visit him. His family would live with him. This was a home. Mm -hmm. 
centuries later, the rock hewn from these mountains was again being used for protection and defense in the form of slate. Now tourists watch spellbound as a lone expert at Wales's Museum of Slate shows his craft. Once, wafers from here sealed the world's roofs against wind and rain. But to curator David Roberts, things are not what they used to be. It's sad to think that a craft, a quarryman's craft, has now deteriorated to being a museum piece and nothing else. And how do you see things going from now on? Well, I think the quarries in Wales certainly have a commercial future. Um, several smaller quarries have reopened in the last few years and sales of slate are picking up very rapidly. So I think there is a bright future for the industry once again, but I don't think it will ever recover to its condition in the last century. That was a time when Snowdonia's quarrymen made slate a major industry. the grey stone from the mountains had to yield before roofing material more readily available. So now, many of the workings are abandoned. The commanding heights are again the province of fauna and flora, rare alpine plants. Creatures bashful, and bold. <laughs> Snowdonia's upland scenery has always attracted artists of vision. A canvas by Julius Caesar Ibbotson shows how difficult communications once were. Richard Wilson came here. And also Turner. Artists were the first tourists. And however rugged the surrounds, it's possible for a painter to make himself comfortable. Royal Academician Cuffin Williams is among Wales's leading landscape artists today. The peaks of Snowdonia provided a backdrop for his childhood on Anglesey. Preparatory work at height. Cuffin Williams has painted abroad, but these mountains never cease to fuel his artistry. The Welsh name for the great central peak is Arwydfa, flanked by Llywedd and Crib Goch, the Red Ridge. The drawings are advanced into oils by the painter, faithfully reproducing the angularities of this terrain. When forms and figures appear, they are dwarfed by what is around them. Meanwhile, hundreds of feet below the artist's eerie, the rocks conceal a tourist attraction at least as potent as the great outdoors, Snowdonia's inner personality. These visitors are embarking on a subterranean guided tour as guests of the Central Electricity Generating Board in an electric van, of course. A staggering 10 miles of tunnelling through solid rock knits together the De Norwig hydroelectric pumped storage power station beside Llyn Paris. In one of the biggest contracts of its kind ever placed in Britain, three million tonnes of rock were excavated to create a warren of mighty caverns. When De Norwig is called upon to generate electricity, 
a hundred thousand gallons of water a second cascade from an upper lake down into the depths of the mountain, activating massive machines. They generate at peak hours. Later, they reverse to pump the water back to fall again. De Norway can meet a sudden demand for electricity anywhere instantly. From this situation where we're spinning in air, ready to generate, it can have its full load of 300 megawatts out in 10 seconds. Do you enjoy taking people around? I always enjoy showing people around De Norway. Uh, it's a fantastic achievement. There's so much to show you and tell you. And in fact, it's a pity we don't have more time so that you can see more of it. It's one of the biggest engineering achievements we have, and it's in North Wales. Remember the water you mentioned at the beginning. Where did it come from? From the upper reservoir, from Marklin Mower. Initially, I was a little worried about what they would do to the mountain, especially since they've the upper lake at Marklin Maur has been built at a point almost at 3,000 feet above sea level, a remote area, a beautiful area, but a good job has been done. The unrelenting rains of northern Wales mean that Snowdonia's contours have been smoothed and beautified by water. Now, to many, Snowdonia is synonymous with power because of the plenitude of water and the height from which it falls. And near the village of Trausfynydd, famed in the 18th century for healthy air and the longevity of its inhabitants, is the site of one of Britain's nuclear power stations. It was designed for minimum environmental impact and is close to a lake that provides a reliable water supply. Locally, there's confidence in the plant's design and the thorough monitoring procedures carried out. Despite the vigilance of the authorities, some people are still anxious about the station, its effect on the natural environment, and the possible impact of the replacement station that might be built here. The Central Electricity Generating Board say they are sensitive to such concern, and they can point to the crucial input to the local economy made by the 600 pay packets that leave here. Surely, any reasonable development would be preferable to the loss of jobs and income that would result if the generation of power here just stopped. In southern Snowdonia are other handsome peaks. Caderidris, Tennyson and the 19th century diarist Francis Kilbert were relieved to descend safely from its crags where the well say, if you spend the night, you will go mad. The Aran Massif, nudging 3,000 feet, looms above Bala Lake the largest natural stretch of water in Wales. Here, visitors can mess about in boats, or learn navigation from experts like Elwyn Hughes. You can bring the front end of the boat up into the wind by pushing this till they're away from you like that. And that, you see, that brings the front of the boat up into the wind. Or you can go the opposite, which is pull the tiller towards you, which brings the back end of the boat into the wind, and eventually the wind will get round the other side of the sail and slam it over. And that's a very violent movement, yeah. which is called jibing. And that's the dangerous one. Danger is a prime ingredient of the challenge Snowdonia holds out for climbers. By world standards, these are pygmy peaks, but Hillary and Tenzing trained on them for Everest. Ooh. Don't lose your hat. Don't lose your hat. It's kind of windy. Sidonia is a great nursery for climbers of all ability. Some people come here simply to walk, others to climb seriously. Good man. Sure. 
chalk everywhere. <laughs> At outdoor centres, the basics are taught before climbers oh, yeah. take their courage in their hands and move oh, towards beautiful. the sky. Okay. Superb. There are other ways of reaching summits. An accident happened on the Snowdon Mountain Railway the day after it opened, in 1896. Ever since then, sightseers by the thousand have been borne aloft by rack and by pinion without mishap. The journey is five miles, the destination three and a half thousand feet up. Before the age of steam, the traveller George Borrow walked to the summit with his daughter Henrietta. The Welsh, he told her, consider this climb the most remarkable in the world. Every day there's something slightly different. The clouds, the light, the weather. Today, the summit promises to be clear. Expectations are high. Journey's end for the climbers. The passengers step out onto one of Britain's great vantage points. But though the day is young, a lot of people have had the same idea. Well, it's been estimated that half a million people reach the summit every year, whether by train or by foot. That's a great number of people. But however amply populated, the summit of Snowdon is the great consummation. For a few moments, the certainty of being the highest creature in Wales and England. And it's a tremendous platform for a Welshman to contemplate his country. And to ponder the vulnerability of Britain's wild places. The pressure increases, it won't go away. But it can be diffused when individuals and great organisations act with good sense and responsibility. Snowdonia can go on taking the strain. The accessible wilderness need not be damaged. Thank you.